Um, we're going to start this session now, which is Improving Doctor-Patient Communication, a Two-Way Street. I am Nikita Joshi. Um, I am emergency medicine faculty here at Stanford, and I'm going to be moderating the session. Our first speaker is Ida Sim. She's going to be talking about BYO app, bridging the data gap between patients and clinicians. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Ida Sim. I'm the co-founder of OpenM Health, which is a nonprofit organization building an open uh, platform for integrating digital health data. I'm also a primary care physician at UCSF. So I've lost count of the tens of thousands of health apps and devices out there that are helping us to track and manage our health. And ignore the sound over, we'll have that off in a little bit. Now, many companies like Apple and Samsung and many others, of course, know that there's great value in bringing digital data together uh, for smarter sense making, and that's going to give us valuable um, insights into our, into our personal health. And that's a great opportunity, uh, but actually there's an even bigger opportunity. Over 75% of healthcare costs, yeah, yeah let's mute him. Over 75% of healthcare costs are from chronic diseases, from high blood pressure, from obesity. We have uh, Mike McConnell on. So. Great, thanks. Um, and over half of Americans have at least one chronic disease. So if digital health data is gonna have an impact on healthcare, it's gonna have to address the clinical care situation. And we're gonna have to integrate many different types of data together to give personalized clinical insights. And, then, and that's insights for patients and doctors to use together to both manage and prevent chronic disease. Now, sense making for clinical use is gonna require a much closer attention to data, to workflow, and to the joint doctor-patient user experience than just health data for you know, individual uh, consumer use. So the question of the day is, how can digital health data be usable in a clinical practice in a meaningful, effective way. So before getting to uh, treatment, let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. And for most of you, this is gonna be pretty old hat. So the first thing is, there's no easy way to share data. Many of my patients bring in a notebook of blood pressure readings or glucose readings, and sometimes it's meticulous data and sometimes it's a mess. And of course you're thinking, ha, there's an app for that. You know, that's true. But frankly, as a doctor, I don't have the time, the interest, nor the patience to keep up with all those apps. Um, it's hard for me to know which ones to trust. And within a short visit time, I don't have the time to go to uh, different websites of all the different apps to struggle with their data displays. It's just way too much work. It's just not gonna work. Now on the patient side, tracking is actually pretty hard and onerous too. And with both patients and doctors very getting uh, not a whole heck of a lot of value out of the data, you know, there's often not the cupcake at the end. So OpenM Health is working to solve these issues. We're working to build the road to bring digital health data into the heart of clinical care today. Here are the three key points about our approach. The first is that we need to think about digital health data just like any other data. It's not anything special. Just like lab data, just like CT scan data, it needs to come back into a workflow in a way that makes sense to me. We need to use that data collaboratively and with purpose. So patients and doctors together need to decide what data we want to order, why we order that, and what we're going to do with that data, and not just track whatever the latest hot startup is offering, right? For doctors, it's about the data, not about the apps, okay? Now, that data needs to come back to uh, patients in a ways that they can use, and it needs to come back to me as a clinician in a way that's just like any other data that I use clinically. Now imagine if I order a CT scan and I need to think, okay, so what's the latest best machine on the market? And I have to decide what the, sh the scanning protocol is. And then when the data comes back, I need to go to a separate website and log in and you know, th that's just not gonna work. But really that's what's being asked of us for consumer health apps today and it's just not going to work. So again, it's about um, the, the uh, data, uh, not about the apps for us. And the data, of course, has to come back to us in a way that supports a stronger doctor-patient relationship, uh, not in a way that burdens us. So I'm happy to introduce to you uh, today a sneak preview of LINK, which is an open M Health product initiative that solves for these problems and, and brings data, uh, digital health data into the, into the clinical, uh, into the clinical uh, care process. 
Um, I'm gonna be introducing this using a pretty typical case study of hypertension, although LINK can be useful for uh, any other clinical condition as well. We will be deploying uh, LINK, uh, piloting it in Stanford Preventive Cardiology this fall, and Dr. Mike McConnell is on the line with us. He's on a Google Hangout, and he'll be with us uh, later on in our, in our talk here. So uh, let's start off imagining Sean. He's 44. Uh, he works hard. Uh, he's on the road a lot uh, in sales. He tends not to eat very well. Uh, he loves spending time with his family, uh, grilling and go-karting, and you know, exercise just doesn't fit in his routine very much. Um, he's, uh, he came in to see me back in June, and you know, his blood pressure is high. It's 150, in the low 150s over you know, the low 90s, which is over the threshold of 140 over 90, which buys him a formal diagnosis of hypertension. This also means that he's at increased risk for heart disease and stroke, and that really worries him because his dad died of a heart attack in his early 50s. Now, when somebody uh, has a blood pressure over 140 over 90, you know, the, the question automatically comes up, it's time to start medication. And like most of us, Sean doesn't want to start a medication, so we talk about ways that he can reduce his blood pressure without meds. And that's exercising more and eating a little bit better. So we talk about that and we decide to give him a chance and see how much he can lower his blood pressure just through uh, lifestyle changes. So a couple months has passed, it's now June, Sean comes back, and you know, like most of my patients, he wasn't all that successful, right? Didn't exercise that much, joined a gym, didn't really go. Uh, it was really hard to change his diet. It's just, it's just really, really hard. Uh, and his blood pressure is still high. It's still over 140, over 90, and so we have to start meds. Let's say benazoprol 10 milligrams, which is a pretty low dose. So now our joint task is to manage his blood pressure through lifestyle changes and as low a dose of medicine as possible. And it would be really useful for both of us if we knew how he was responding to his medications. So this is where Link comes in. Link um, is, a, is, a, is a product that allows us, allows me and Sean, to create a tracking plan around his blood pressure and his physical activity. So we decide with Sean that uh, he's gonna get a blood pressure cuff, right? And he's gonna check his blood pressure once a day in the morning before he takes his benazoprol, and he's gonna do so for two months until the next time that we see each other in person. Now, I know that with blood pressure medicines, you know, by <coughs> about three weeks, I should uh, clearly have, a, have a, um, uh, a sense of whether his blood pressure medicines are working, and if his blood pressure at that time is still over 140, over 90, I will increase the dose to 20 milligrams a day, okay? So what I do then is I ask Link to notify me uh, if his average weekly blood pressure is over 140, over 90, about three weeks from now. And I also uh, set some bounds for uh, um, you know, emergency alerts if his blood pressure should go way high, uh, which I think is, is really unlikely. Now, Sean doesn't, uh, wants to minimize his medication use, and you know, he's, he's not really motivated to improve his, his activity. Uh, and uh, it turns out that his employer has uh, given him a coupon for a Fitbit, and so we say, yeah, that might be interesting to track his activity levels, right? Now, the American Heart Association uh, recommends 150 minutes a week of moderate uh, intensity exercise. So we discuss what that means and what it takes to get 250 minutes a week. That's actually really hard. And he says, no way, no way. Um, we decide that 80 maybe is a more reasonable goal. So we set that as a goal. Um, he also wants to track weight. Um, that's okay with me. We don't set a goal for that. We just track it for informational purposes. And I know that the heart rate is also captured automatically with a lot of blood pressure cuffs. So we track that too, okay? So now I click send, and what that does is it saves the tracking plan and it sends it to Sean. And voila, as a doc, I am done, okay, I'm done. All I need to know is that I've ordered data that's reasonably accurate and that it's gonna come back to me in a timely, useful way. I am so glad I didn't have to be up on the latest blood pressure cuff, the latest activity monitor, okay? I'm done, okay? So, so far, so good for me. This is what I do when I order a CT scan or a lab test, right? What about Sean? So Sean gets an email invitation to um, uh, download the Link app, which he does on his phone, and he accepts the invitation. And um, the, inv the Link app also helps him to uh, give some advice about devices. And so he chooses the Y Things blood pressure cuff, the uh, Fitbit, uh, and also he kind of goes on a spending spree and buys the Aria scale too. So he hooks and connects all that up, okay? Um, now, of course, that's the easy part, uh, buying gadgets. It's uh, much harder, of course, to track every day. So Link helps um, 
patients uh, with strategies for daily tracking. Uh, he gets uh, little cards like this in the, in the mail to help him remi remember to track. And we know that for many patients, tracking is not something that they're used to, and, uh, and that we, uh, we are really using a lot of design principles of our designer, Katie McCurdy, to understand how to help patients track every day uh, and to give them strategies uh, to, to uh, make that be successful. And of course, it's also important that doctors and patients together decide what to track for how long and why. That's really part of the, the motivational uh, support for, for tracking as well. So when Sean tracks, the data comes back to his own app. If I wanted to, I can peek at the data uh, through my own clinician view, but I'm, I'm unlikely to do that. I wait and you know, three weeks later, lo and behold, I get a message in my inbox, which is where I do all my clinical work. So just like any other data, it comes back to me and it tells me that Sean's blood pressure is indeed still high. It's still over 140, over 90. So I uh, see details, I click on it, I go to link, and I see that his uh, blood pressure is still over the 140 over 90 threshold. Uh, and I can see that the, the, uh, you know, the daily blood pressures, and I, I see that uh, there are times when his blood pressure is over uh, the threshold, the systolic, which is the higher number, uh, is above range, so that's the orange parts. But I notice that he's sort of in fits and starts, right? Sometimes he's well controlled and sometimes he's not. And that brings to mind that, well, maybe he's just not, you know, he's not taking his medications daily on a regular basis. That makes me something. So I call him up and I talk to him and we review the data together, him on his uh, uh, device and, and mine on, on my own device, and he admits, yeah, he's been kind of spotty. Uh, a friend told him that, you know, you can get hooked on blood pressure medicines, and once you start, you can't get off them. I hear that a lot from my patients. So we talk about that, he's reassured, and I decide not to increase his dose, but to encourage his adherence and to continue tracking, okay? So I also informed Link uh, then to notify me again three weeks from now if his average blood pressure exceeds 140 over 90. Now, what would this, uh, let's take a pause in the Sean story here and see what is my daily practice like without Sean? What would really have happened? Well, I would have started Sean on 10 milligrams of lisinopril. Three weeks later, he would come back, right? Park, which is hard, uh, see the nurse. I would get a note in my inbox and then my nurse would say, you know, Sean's back, his blood pressure's over 140 over, I get one reading, right? I would get a note that he doesn't have any side effects and his adherence is pretty good, right? Because practically everyone says their adherence is pretty good, I would. Um, and I probably honestly would have increased his dose. He'd be up to 20, okay? And I would think we did a good job, okay? So I would have missed a deeper understanding of what's going on. I would have missed the opportunity to have a discussion with Sean, okay? <coughs> and both him and the nurse would have had an extra visit and all of that would not have to happen with Link, okay? So going back to the Link story then, um, I wait three weeks. And um, uh, you know it's August 2nd now, and I actually haven't heard anything, and he shows up. So now it's two months after starting Benazepril, and it's now about five weeks after our initial phone call. We reviewed the data, and lo and behold, his blood pressure is now under goal. I see that there's more uh, you know, uh, adherence, we think, right? Because uh, there's a little bit of fluctuation, but overall the, the trend is pretty good. We also see that he's been more active. You know, didn't really start off active, but really picked up in the last couple of weeks, right? Uh, maybe even a little bit of weight loss there too. So this gives us some more data to have a deeper discussion. What worked, what didn't work. Um, and we talk about, you know, 80, girl, 80 minutes is really just not feasible. Um, so we talk about, and he says, you know, maybe I can do 50 minutes. And that, that's a reasonable goal. And that might help us eventually get to 150 minutes. Okay. So this has been very useful, and, and Sean admits that having this kind of data and having that phone call really showed that um, I was holding him accountable, and he found that motivating and, and encouraging indeed. Okay. So overall, Link gave us a far more positive, personalized experience. From the patient's point of view, uh, he's got positive reinforcement for making health behavior changes, and overall, he had a healthier outcome, right? He's exercising more, he's only on lysinopril, 10 milligrams, his blood pressure is controlled. For my part, um, I was able to titrate a medication more quickly. Um, sometimes this takes months because <laughs> the patient forgets to come back in three weeks. Um, uh, overall, there's less utilization, right, with a, a fewer uh, clinic visits, uh, hopefully lower cost because there's more blood pressure control earlier. Uh, and more importantly, I think we build a stronger doctor-patient relationship, and that's going to have dividends uh, in the future. That, that, is, that is very important. Uh, so we're we deploying um, Link in uh, uh, Stanford with uh, Dr. McConnell. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ida, and thanks to Larry and the MedicineX team for 
giving us a chance to talk about the OpenML platform and link today. As I mentioned, I'm a cardiologist here at Stanford, working on both prevention and innovation in cardiovascular health. I'm really very excited about the potential for LINK and the OpenML platform to bring mobile and digital data into our clinical practice. As clinicians, as you heard from Ida describing, we really struggle with how to integrate all these data into the care of our patients without disrupting our very busy clinical workflow. With LINK, uh, easy to view and review this mobile health data with our patients without having to worry about the specific app or device that it might be coming from. This is really critical towards helping doctors and nurses use these mobile health data towards our main goal, which is helping our patients stay healthy. Staying active, a healthy diet, blood pressure control, all of these are really fundamental to our effort forward to testing link for our Thank you very much. Thanks. So you probably got the gist of that. Um, we are uh, super excited to be uh, partnering with uh, Mike here at Stanford. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the issue though is that while we're piloting Link in hypertension, it's really a general approach. Anytime we need patient generated data between clinic visits, Link is an approach that's usable. So for example, uh, tracking uh, asthma inhaler use and wheezing symptoms. Is the kid's uh, asthma worse at school, maybe at, uh, at grandma's house? Tracking pain and mobility after hip surgery to make sure someone's on the, on the right track for recovery. Uh, tracking pain and response to pain medications for lowest effective uh, medication dose. Tracking sleep to see if uh, uh, lack of sleep is a trigger for migraines. So all of these use cases use some of the data that is also useful in Sean's case, but also of course other types of data. So we are expanding our data sources, uh, where these are some of the uh, data sources that are incorporated into LINK right now, but we are including other data sources, obviously, including uh, HealthKit uh, coming up, and that's gonna bring it, uh, make it more flexible for patients to you know, bring their own apps, right? Uh, to, to use whatever apps and devices they might want to fulfill a tracking plan. So uh, this is gonna allow us to uh, uh, support uh, more use cases. And what's really exciting is that the uh, data sources and the data integration that we have underlying link will be available for free in an open source platform, the OpenM Health platform for developers. As I said at the outset, OpenM Health is a nonprofit organization. Our fundamental goal is to increase uh, the use of digital health data and bring clinical meaning to digital health. And we are not gonna do that alone. We need to do that together, all of us in this room, in this conference, and then beyond. And the OpenM Health Platform is our main offering to developers so that we can do this together. Under the hood, the uh, platform has open source data schemas to give third party data and more clinical <laughs> meeting, has open source API wrappers to uh, common devices, and it also has some basic processing modules to get developers started. So if you're a developer, the OpenM Health Platform is gonna be a one-stop toolkit uh, that's gonna help you build products like Link. Link is built on it, but there are other products you can build on it, of course, to build your own um, insanely great products. So if you have other data sources that you wanna include, data streams that you wanna make sense of, um, let us know. If you're not a developer, but you're a patient or a clinician, uh, we need you just as much. We'll be rolling out Link um, in other, with other clinical partners, always looking for clinicians, patients, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers uh, to give us input. So please link up with us, join our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for one question. If anybody has a question, and I also just want to remind everyone, I'm sorry I didn't say this before, but if you have any questions, I am going through the tweets, so by all means, please send it out with the hashtag MedEx. So one question I had was, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the digital data and all the apps that are out there, and I'm curious, what type of research did you do when you first came up with the idea of Link to differentiate your app to make it useful for doctors as opposed to all the other apps that are out there. And as a doctor, I wanna know that the app I use is the right one. 
Yeah, I, I think we've taken a very user-centered approach. Uh, we've done a lot of um, on-the-ground uh, interviews of patients and doctors and care systems to understand what's really useful. Um, I think we've taken a lot of inspiration from products that are, that are on the market. But I think what really distinguishes us is the notion of sort of this bring-your-own-app idea. Um, and it's really the platform underlying it, which relies on the open architecture, which relies on the fundamental idea of open M health, that data is free and that it can flow, but that it flows in a meaningful way. That's really the ultimate distinguishing point uh, with our product and our, and our idea. So I think... Uh, Thank you so much. So now I'm going to introduce Luis Aronson. Are you going to use this? Or? Her talk is on Beyond Patient Doctor Communication, Moving Medicine into the 21st Century. Okay. Um, so when we think about patient doctor communication, we often think about the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and there was reference made this morning in the med-ed section to the one-on-many. And that's more the part of uh, patient doctor communication that I'm going to talk about, but I want to think about the one on many, but also the many on one, because I think one of the distinguishing features of patient doctor communication in the 21st century is that it's much more bi directional or multi directional than it ever was. Uh, so I'm going to start actually by telling a story of an experience I had maybe two years ago now. So I'm a geriatrician at UC San Francisco and I do house calls. So what that means for me usually is that I hear little bits of different things on the radio. Sometimes the same little bit over and over, unfortunately. Anyway, so I'm driving along. Uh, I've just gotten in my car after a house call and I turn on the radio and it's a discussion of mammography. And there is a physician talking about mammograms, particularly for women in their 40s. Some of you will know this is a little bit controversial and I don't wanna uh, be uh, distracted by the controversy in particular. But so she's talking about mammograms and why they might not be a good idea for women in their 40s. And as she's talking and as I'm driving, I'm thinking, wow, she must have had media training. She's doing a really good job. She was taking big data sets and she was speaking really clearly um, and giving good examples of things. And, and I was just basically impressed. So this goes on for a little bit and I'm getting close to where I'm going. And then there's, they decide to take a call on this program. So they take a call and it's a young woman and she tells the story of her sister who at age 42 with two small children had a mammogram and the mammogram found breast cancer. And it was a pretty bad breast cancer, but she got treatment and she's alive and well now. And basically, that one story from a patient who called in changed the entire tenor of the interview of the part I saw after that. Because what the doctor did was she came back again with more data. And she again was really clear and really articulate and she still lost that interview. She lost the conversation because the story about the young woman with two small children and breast cancer found by the mammogram was what was winning and everybody else who called in after that referenced that. So she kind of lost, lost her opportunity to influence mine. So I'm gonna keep that in mind as we go through this talk, but uh, it's because she was speaking in a way that we spoke in the 20th century. When I say we, I say, I mean health professionals uh, and maybe not in the way we need to be speaking here in the 21st century. So just to review here a bit, so doctor-patient communication for a long time looked like this, right? Um, you'll note a few things. We've got a white male. He's talking. <laughs> Poor guy here is listening. Um, but basically, it's a one-directional conversation. In the modern era, it's changed a little bit. We've got the computer. Uh, we've got a different sort of physician. She's in the home. But still, doctor-patient communication, the traditional type. Now there's another kind here, which isn't totally clear, but it's here in the stacks here. Um, there is scholarly communication. So in the 20th century, there were basically two types of communication. You talked to the patient or you published articles in scholarly journals, largely for people who had the same expertise as you did um, and might actually have already heard of your work at a conference. Uh, and, and that was it, that was basically it. And then this happened. 
So I don't know how many of you here have a desk that looks like this, but you know, there's some of the traditional things here. But there's all kinds of other stuff going on that really wasn't going on previously. And that has changed how we communicate, who we communicate with, how we should be communicating, and lots of opportunities to influence each other in ways that improve health and health care. So this is Clay Shirky, whom you may have heard of. He's written several books, but he really talks about the media. And he coined a term that I'm really fond of, which is a new communications ecosystem. And that just means the way we interact, each part in an ecosystem, each part influences the other ones. And the digital revolution has really changed everything about how we communicate. And we all live in this new communications ecosystem. And yet still, particularly in, in medical schools, there was a little discussion of this this morning, uh, we're still really training about doctor-patient or clinician-patient communication. Uh, and scholarly communication, and not about a lot of the other kinds that come up in this new communications ecosystem. And that matters because even doctors, even nurses, even pharmacists are first and foremost human beings, which means they're all doing this. People get their news online, on their devices. They tweet to each other. They post things on Facebook. It has completely changed how we learn how we get information, and it's bi-directional, whereas things didn't used to be bi-directional. Now you actually can talk back to the New York Times if you want. OK, so some people may recognize this guy. I'm going to now give four examples of how a clinician, a health systems leader, an educator, uh, and a researcher have used this new kind of communication to further discussions of health and their own career. So this is Kevin Foe, and you may have heard of Kevin MD. Uh, this is one of the biggest and most influential healthcare blogs. And this started because Kevin was a primary care physician in New Hampshire. And when something new would happen, generally in that favorite medical journal of people, uh, the New York Times, or sometimes given where he was, the Boston Globe, uh, he would get the same phone calls uh, and then later on emails from patients with the same questions. And he would have to answer each one. And he's a primary care doctor. He does not have time to do it. Right? But he wants to do the right thing. So he realizes if he just writes it once really clearly and explains what's going on and then sends it out to everybody, that works. Well, so you can be sending emails to everyone, but, but basically the blog is born. Uh, and he becomes one of the greatest influencers uh, in healthcare. And now he has a blog to which lots of people contribute, uh, patients and clinicians of all sorts. This is Bob Wachter, who uh, yesterday we were told at UCSF, he's at UCSF, he coined the hospitalist uh, term and movement, basically, uh, and it was named as one of the top 100 influencers in healthcare. And that is probably not so much because of his 250 medical journal articles, although those probably count for something. Um, but what he decided was he was, he had started the hospitalist movement and he was really interested in quality and safety but he could not get any traction within medicine. So he started writing public articles, and in fact, he wrote a book called Internal Bleeding, which became a New York Times bestseller. And that got the attention of the people who actually do change policy, of the people in Washington, and it got people talking about it. And it was that move, that move into the public sector, that talking to people, not just within the profession, but to fellow citizens, that really led to the quality and safety movement. This is Roseanne Leipzig, uh, who is one of the better geriatrics educators, uh, which probably means no one but Leslie and I have heard of her. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she has made a huge difference in geriatrics education nationally. And she hasn't done much public communication, but she wrote one op-ed for the New York Times, which was the most emailed op-ed for a couple of weeks. And what it did is it took basically her life's work in developing what are core competencies for the care of older adults that each physician should have. Uh, and talked about it. And she framed it, uh, <laughs> it was published on July 1st, and she talked about how lore has it that July isn't a very good time to get sick, right? Why? Because we've got the new interns. And then she talks about how it's even worse if you're in your 80s because no one's trained on that. And she goes on from there. So she did it once, but she did it in a way that sort of brought what she had spent her life working on into the public and led to some changes and mandates in how we train physicians. This is Alex Smith, who's in palliative care. 
he came up with something called e-prognosis. And there was an article on this in JAMA. Uh, and so, you know, JAMA is a pretty good place to be published, and probably lots of people would read the article. But he's digitally savvy. And so what did he do? He did a, and he's sort of media savvy. So he wrote a piece for the New England Journal, which told a story of a patient. And if you were to read that, you might wonder, um, wouldn't it be interesting if I had a way of getting some sense of how long a person might live if they were 88 and had all these various problems? And that kind of makes you want e-prognosis. Then he had something in a blog that is often followed by the New York Times. So then the New York Times picks it up. And basically, then it goes national and international, which means the research on which he spent several years actually has a much bigger impact than it would have, even if, if it had appeared in JAMA. And JAMA is a pretty darn good outcome if you're a researcher. So there are all these ways that we can be engaged in publicly communicating our work and communicating with people and patients uh, that we haven't really taken advantage of until now. Um, the other thing that I should mention is in each of these cases, it allowed the people who had developed these things to hear back how they were and were not working for the people they were intended to serve, and that made them better. So this new communications ecosystem is already changing medicine. Medical journals used to only be science. And now, I don't know about you, but I get the New England Journal in my inbox on Wednesdays, and all I see are the essays. Actually, if I want to see science, I have to scroll down. Why? That's not just random on the part of the New England Journal. That's because everybody, including the clinicians, prefers to read the stories and essays over the science. Doesn't mean they're not reading the science, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and most conferences have, uh, have sections on, on how to write in this public way, but it really is a different skill set. Okay, so this area we call public medical communication, and it's the third type. So there's doctors and patients speaking one-on-one, -on -one. they're speaking in a scholarly way, and then there's public medical communication, and that's basically a few different things. It's different sorts of writing or communication, right? We, we broaden what you can do. Uh, it's who you're speaking to. Who's the audience? The audience is really different. The audience has unlimited potential. And this was the new communication ecosystem that Clay Shirky talked about, right? The Arab Spring. There are all kinds of examples of how you can speak to people across time and geography in a way you couldn't previously. Um, it's, mo it's by health professionals, and then to further the discussion and understanding of health and healthcare. And that's actually different, too. It's not about me disseminating my results or us discussing uh, your diabetes. It's about really thinking about healthcare in larger ways. So it's a different kind of activity. So why name this? Why, why even think about this? Um, well, there are a few reasons. One is that it's probably a unique skill set, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Why, why this sort of communication is different from the kinds we've done previously. Recognition. So Amin Azam at the, at the education section this morning said, um, people don't get credit for blogging, and they don't get credit for updating Wikipedia, as he's training medical students to do. They only get credit for the sorts of things that we used to do. And yet, if you write a blog or you update Wikipedia such that people get accurate information, you're probably reaching way more people. So we need to think about what's actually having an impact on health and on lots of people, and not just the traditional ways of communicating. There's also regulation. I don't know if you've been following what's going on with Dr. Oz, which is kind of ironic, because he was one of the first and best at public medical communication. He had a way of explaining really complicated things using illustrations, using analogies that really helped people understand complex ideas. Now, it's a shame when he began to use those talents, apparently, um, allegedly, uh, to, to sell some things you know, and some ideas that might not be true. So that's ironic. But we also need to, if we're going to recognize, we need to regulate that people are do using this for the good of patients uh, and not to sell things. And then transformation. The world, you know, we are already transforming how we deal with medicine and health, as we're discussing at this conference. And if you have the language uh, to discuss which skill sets and which approaches you're taking, you're in better shape. 
So now I'm just going to talk about a few ways of making this useful. And this, for those who aren't health professionals, are things that help us all communicate with other people. So there are five useful techniques. The first one is speaking English, not in jargon. And you know this when you hear someone who speaks in a jargon that isn't yours. But, but this is a, a message often lost. So just using regular words. Data. Less is more. So I like to say that data is a bit like sculpture, right? So the sculpture, what you see is what's there. But actually, what you see is defined mostly by what isn't there, by what you've taken away. So one of the key things with data is to make the key points visible by using only a few points, and not so many. And this is particularly uh, where scientists and, and sometimes clinicians get into trouble. Next is getting personal. So this is antithetical to what we're taught most of the time. You're not supposed to put yourself out there. Uh, social media ha has sort of complicated that in some ways. But certainly in professional notes, in professional scholarly articles, you don't use the I. You don't put your opinion. But this comes back to the story thing of who wins the arguments. The human being wins the arguments, the person with the more compelling story. Uh, and if you introduce yourself or someone you care about and the act of you caring about that person into the story, you're actually going to win more hearts and minds. Uh, and if you don't believe this, look at all marketing. Look at how politicians win things. Our organizations understand this in the way they highlight stories. Think of the Olympics and the focus on different stories. This is how people get people's attention. Knowing your audience. So different stories and different focus will work for different groups. We tend to take a one-size-fits-all approach, and that probably doesn't work. And then knowing what you want. This is another thing. It's not just to get it out there. It's to communicate something or to begin a dialogue with someone and to be very clear about what you want. Uh, there's another thing that works, which is humor. But it actually only works for people who are funny, and most of us aren't so funny. So use that one with caution. Uh, but then really the most important thing is story. And I'm actually just going to borrow this final point from a guy called Paul Zak, who is a neuroeconomist. Uh, you can actually look this up on YouTube. Uh, and if you don't know what a neuro neuroeconomist is, that puts you in lots of really good company. Uh, but <laughs> let me explain and it will become obvious. So he has a lab, and he brings in volunteers, and he has them watch a video. And the video is about a little boy named Ben and his dad. And Ben has cancer. And the dad is telling you about cancer and, and saying, look, Ben is playing. And Ben's really happy because he's been through the chemo and radiation and it's ended. And Ben's playing and he's happy. And then the dad looks kind of sad. And he says, but it's hard for me to be happy for Ben because I know something Ben doesn't know. And what the dad knows is that Ben is dying. And the dad goes on to say, you know, it's really hard when you know how little time you have left. And he kind of merges himself with his son in that moment in thinking he only has a little bit of time left. So in his lab, Paul Zak has people listen to that story. And then on their way out, they're asked to give money. You know, and money obviously matters in the world. But think of money also as uh, an equivalent for voting or different behavior in terms of health. Uh, and what he finds is that the people who give the most money and who give money without hesitation are the people who've had two reactions to this story. Uh, one is a rise in their cortisol levels. So here's where the, the neuro of the neuroeconomist comes in. He's drawing levels. Um, increased cortisol levels, that gets people's attention, and that's associated with distress. So there's some distress, not so much that they're paralyzed, but some distress. Uh, and the other one is oxytocin, and that elicits empathy. So one of the key things he's found is that if you want to change behavior, you need to use stories. And the stories need to elicit a little bit of stress. It's sort of three bears, you know, not too much, not too little. Um, and then some empathy. And those are the things that are most likely to change behavior. And if you do that, speaking English, knowing what you want, being personal so that you're demonstrating the empathy, uh, that's the kind of communication that leads to the engagement, leads to the stories, the blog posts, the effective videos, uh, the medical journal personal narrative articles, the op-eds that really are starting to shape what's happening in health policy and care. This is the new desktop. 
and public medical communication is probably the third type of communication that people in health and medicine need to master uh, to sort of live in this world in which this is the reality. Hi, I'm Cheryl Katz. I'm on the faculty at the UC Davis uh, Betty Irene School of Nursing. I am a psychologist by training. Um, and I came to this conference last year uh, as a bit of a spectator just to see what was going on. And I noticed something interesting as a theme um, that I took away from the meeting last year. And that was that there was this surprising mismatch between patients and providers' uh, interests and abilities to share and to meaningfully use information that was collected uh, through mHealth technology. And the reason I was surprised um, is because at a conference like this, the people that show up, I figured would be sort of a bias sample of people who were able to do this and felt maybe a little more, more satisfied. Now the flip side of that is, you know, I work with um, a cardiology group at UC Davis where the physicians want their elderly, pretty sick heart failure patients to um, use telemonitoring devices and the patients are not so sure about that. So, I, you know, it spans both spectrums, but I think it's worth pointing out that even in a group like this, um, there is this kind of mismatch between patients and physicians' ability to use things together. And so what got me thinking about it was this, this idea um, that we'd been kicking around at our, gr our group. Uh, I collaborated a good bit with folks at Group Health Research Institute where I previously worked. And we were thinking about how do you make things patient-centered? If the patients want to use and connect their data that's collected from a mobile health device with their care. And so, you know, we talk about this disconnect, and you've heard it again this year, I think, in, in many of the sessions. And the thought that we had is that you not only does it need to be patient centered, but it needs to be provider friendly, and not just physician friendly, but like provider team friendly in order to actually meet that patient need to communicate more effectively with the folks who are providing their care. So I'm not advocating that we be physician-centric, just to be clear. I'm advocating um, here that we need to take the whole group, the whole constellation of people who are potential users of mHealth data into account at the design stage. So this is kind of my visualization of what Ida was, I think, describing in, in her talk. Um, on the left, you see, I think this is what the data kind of feels like to a provider who's being barraged with a bunch of, you know, maybe it's Fitbit data or maybe something uh, from a, a self-tracker about ear meds or what have you. It's like this big mash of stuff and what do I do with it? Um, and what we need in order is to make sense of the shared mobile health data, shared between patients and provider teams, and to try and figure out who needs which pieces and how do, we, how do we organize it and who on the team's the right person to get it. Maybe it's not the physician at all. You know, maybe, um, maybe it's the pharmacist who needs a particular piece of information and wants to use that piece of information. And so that's kind of the, the premise that I'm talking about today. So, am, just for a little background, um, my colleague Jennifer McClure has a, a grant funded by NIDA um, that I've been uh, working on with her to develop uh, a mobile website that kind of looks like an app, but it goes across whatever platform patients have. So we've, we've designed it as a mobile website um, where we're trying to help people who are quitting smoking to stick with um, Chantix or Varenicline which is a stop smoking medication, um, for the 12 weeks that we know will help them be twice as likely to be quit six months from now if they can um, use that kind of medication for the, the first 12 weeks that they are quitting smoking. And so um, we've been working to support adherence by looking at the kind of symptoms and side effects um, from the medication and from nicotine withdrawal symptoms that people experience that tend to make them quit using the medication. Um, 
And so we've got sort of adherent support plus a smoking cessation kind of self-help content uh, in our mobile website. And it's designed when there's something more serious to flag the physician or the uh, nurse or the quick coach, whoever they're working with, on their clinical team, but only when it's something that's really something that should be actionable. And otherwise, it gives them real time information and tips about symptoms and motivational uh, things that they're experiencing that they can have right there in their pocket um, uh, when it's needed. Because people never call and tell their doc that, oh, you know, I'm having trouble quitting smoking or, you know, I'm uncomfortable with uh, nicotine withdrawal. What do I do? But you might do that uh, looking it up on, on your app. So we both uh, reach out to people and we, they can come to the app whenever they want to get this information. So in the process of getting this funded, and this is just kind of an example of um, uh, when people get their tips back, they click on the ones that, that they've already um, uh, endorsed and then they get a, a little kind of bullet list for each of the things that is a current problem for them. Um, but in the process of developing this, I mean, we, we're just about to launch the pilot trial now. We've spent like a year of development and we're gonna follow that up with um, potential, uh, sur a survey of potential future users. And by that, it's not the patients, because we're doing the patients first. We're gonna look at all the quick coaches and the nurses and the physicians who might be potential users if we rolled this out and show them what the dashboard for the providers looks like that the study team's using um, and get their input about how that would or wouldn't uh, be useful to them in practice with this type of problem. And the, this piece, um, that was prompted uh, by questions from reviewers who I think were physicians who said, gee, I don't know if physicians would be willing to do that or get alerts if someone has, you know, uh, a cardiac issue while they're taking this, this med. They might not want that. Um, and so that got us thinking, um, Jennifer McClure and I, who, who is the PI of this study, um, it got the two of us thinking about what, um, in a really broad sense, when we look at things like treatment adherence for other chronic conditions, whether this is going to be a really broad based issue. And I think from the things that I've heard at this conference this year, I would say yes, that, that seems to be a pretty broad um, concern that you know providers uh, really need to um, in order to work collaboratively um, with patients around something like medication adherence. So not physical activity data that maybe they don't care about, but something about, I've prescribed you a medication, are you taking it, and do I need to titrate the dose based on what you're telling me? So something that they might care about, um, that that really needs to happen in a, a different way. Um, adherence is something that cuts across a lot of chronic conditions as well as acute situations like the smoking cessation. Um, and inconsistent medication use is a really common problem, you know, as, as I think any of us who've ever uh, been prescribed a medication long term could attest to. So I really feel like we need a patient provider partnership that enables patients to make good choices and to sustain the health behaviors that they want to, you know, for example, consistent medication use, um, but also many other self-management behaviors. And so I look at, um, you may be familiar with the chronic care model um, that uh, Ed Wagner at Group Health um, has rolled out kind of uh, nationally and internationally. And this is a way of you know, matching up a prepared proactive care team with an informed and activated patient. And the piece that gets left out sometimes is how exactly do you, you know, what's the collaborative piece that makes that happen? So, you know, I've laid out as applied to adherence here, um, kind of four, four core collaborative care elements. 
you know, and it has to do with patients and providers collaboratively defining problems, patients and providers focusing on a specific problem, setting realistic objectives, developing patient-centered action plans that take into account their, the patient preferences and readinesses, um, creating a continuum of self-management training and support services, and providing proactive and sustained follow-up to monitor health status and to identify potential problems and to check and reinforce progress in implementing the care plan. So that's a mouthful, and I'm trying to get through this piece quickly because it just sets the stage um, for what I'm gonna uh, talk about. Um, but I think it's important to be informed both by models of care and behavioral principles when we try and do something like have physicians and their teams and patients work together collaboratively to do something like get patients to, to be able to take their medications consistently if they want to. So the last time I checked, a one-way street seemed to be about half as useful as a two-way street, maybe even a little bit less depending on what direction you want to go. So, you know, the title of this talk is about two-way streets. And I want to end this kind of one-way street where you've got these commercial apps that are consumer-facing and they just don't connect anywhere. Just that's a one-way street. So, you know, people are really using these a lot. And certainly at this conference, we're probably the best examples of that. Um, but not really enough of them not enough of these self-management tools um, are integrated into care. And you've heard, I think, at this session and some earlier ones as well about some of the reasons why they aren't. So how can mHealth tools become a two-way street between patients and their care teams? Well, for these tools to reach their full potential to support patient self-management and to support engagement in care, they need to do a couple things. They need to provide effective and acceptable communication between the patients and their care teams, and they need to be designed from the get-go to be responsive to the needs and the preferences of both patients and their multidisciplinary care team members. They also need to support cl collaborative workflows and to work seamlessly with clinical information systems. So when you have a two-way street in your title, it opens up all sorts of opportunities. Um, so to get to this two-way street, we need to change our priorities ahead. So our next steps are integrating mobile health medication management tools into primary care practice through engaging patients and their primary care teams and using um, communication that's mediated by technology um, in order to monitor um, medication use. So there's an often overlooked user-centered design question, and that has to do um, with the team and not just the patient and not just the physician. So what we need to do first is to understand and articulate what are the design specifications that not just patients need, but the nurse, the care manager, the physician assistant, the physician, the pharmacist. What, what do they need in order to make this data useful and actionable for them to provide the best care for the patient? So what our team's goal is, is um, essentially to look at the patient, the multidisciplinary care team, the data workflow and the clinical workflow to see how this can be accomplished. So laying the foundation for our two-way street. You know, first, to have this kind of bi-directional and effective communication um, with patients who might be using mHealth tools, the tool development needs to be based on an understanding of clinical information needs and the healthcare decision-making processes. So it can't be in isolation, um, separate from what's needed to make good uh, medical decisions or good health decisions on the part of the patient. So what I'm going to talk uh, the rest of the time about 
are kind of four different steps that were, um, that are an example of how our team kind of approaches this issue from a user-centered design perspective. So the first one is describing patient preferences for the design and use of shared patient provider team technology. And we want to do this in order to support um, adherence to long-term meds uh, for things like antihypertensives and lipid lowering medications and uh, meds for diabetes and you know whatever else patients might bring to the table in, in a complicated um, uh, medical situation. But those for example, and we want to get a better understanding of who on the team and what data and when would patients want this kind of data shared. Um, and so, you know, that's step one, mostly the usual patient-centered approach that I think you've all been advocating for uh, at this meeting. Um, and then step two, we want to describe sort of role-specific, so, you know, are you the nurse on the team, the physician on the team, the pharmacist on the team, and disease-specific, you know, is the patient that you're working with someone who's got diabetes and hypertension or just uh, hypertension by itself. And we want to describe the sort of the functionality needs of different kinds of care team members um, that are related to medication adherence to these different kinds of medications for people with different chronic conditions or maybe multiple chronic conditions. And so the idea here is to use things like uh, user personas of um, you know, a sort of a prototypical uh, pharmacist and to collect data from, you know, say 10 pharmacists in different kinds of settings um, about what the prototypical pharmacist would want to use. You know, going back to that image of the puzzle pieces, you know, which of those bags of, puzzle, of sorted puzzle pieces do the pharmacists need? Um, for example, and we would do this with each kind of team member. Um, and um, have scenarios of use for each different kind of chronic condition or a combination of, of several. Um, so a scenario of use is sort of a narrative, usually like a one pager, um, that kind of goes through things like, you know, what if the patient were new to the medication versus if they'd been on it for a long time? And uh, what if they were on a particular kind of regimen um, or that was complex or one that was simple? You know, what would uh, those different scenarios be like? And so using those kind of user-centered design techniques, um, we think the next step then is to come up with a list of design principles and user requirements that outline the specific needs of care team members who would be interacting with this mHealth uh, medication uh, related data. Um, and so you can do things like um, have low fidelity prototypes, you know, paper prototypes and storyboards with, you know, drawing pictures to show both patients and all the constellation of multidisciplinary team members, what the possibilities are for dashboards the provider sees and interfaces um, uh, that the uh, patient sees so that we can get feedback before things are developed on how patients and their provider teams might be able to use this data together in the future. So designing that at the beginning, not does developing something and then after the fact trying to fit it in to, you know, uh, fitting in this square peg into a round hole of, of an EHR. Um, we don't want to do it after the fact. What I'm advocating for is that we think about these kinds of design issues at the beginning. Um, and to really be, um, I think the, the fourth leg of this stool is really looking at data workflows as well as clinical workflows and making things that are going to complement or improve existing clinical processes and technology um, rather than be at odds with it. So 
My take home message here is that in order to pave the way to the two way street, we need I, ideally mobile health tools will be those that patients and care teams want to use together and that they can easily be integrated into practice. So it's based on this idea that to be truly patient centered in supporting chronic disease self management, we need to also design tools to be provider friendly. So, and below uh, is my uh, Twitter handle. For our last and final talk for today, uh, we have Anthony back. He's going to be talking about new roles for physicians in the era of connected e-patients. I'm Tony Bach. I'm a medical oncologist and palliative care uh, physician in Seattle. And uh, I'm both a provider and a little bit of a tracker. I'm in a study where I'm having my uh, fitness, blood, uh, microbiome, you know, genome all tracked. And so I see this kind of from both sides. My collaborator, Gina Neff, is a uh, sociologist who's been studying the e-patient space for some years. One of the reasons we wanted to collaborate on this talk was to talk about this growing disconnect that we are seeing in this world of e-patients and doctors. Um, and here's an example, right? I was at South by Southwest, a panel about tracking. This guy stands up and says, my doctor is a great guy, but he just doesn't have that much data, right? How many of you have heard something like this? Yeah. Uh, contrast this comment to uh, a doctor in one of Gina's studies who said, I don't need more data, I need more resources, right? This is the challenge, this growing disconnect that we are seeing over the notion of data. You know, what is it good for? Uh, when can you use it? What kind of truth does it tell? That's the issue that I'm addressing today. Um, and, you know, as a sidebar, you know, this talk is derived from qualitative studies that Gina and I have both done in different spaces involving interviews with physicians, nurses, patients, designers, users, and observation fieldwork in the health technology space, as well as informal discussions at places like this. Um, but just to get back to this disconnect issue, um, the problem is this. Patients and physicians expect different things of data, right? Gina coined the term um, data valences to talk about the different expectations that users um, have for data. It turns out e-patients, doctors, and designers are all doing something different with data. And the problem happens when we assume that data possess some kind of intrinsic meaning. Right, so what do I mean by that? Let me illustrate. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a new patient as a second opinion. Uh, she was somebody who had been treated with surgery and chemotherapy for GI cancer. Her first CT scan after having all this cancer treatment showed one little dot, right? I don't know if you can even see it. It's right there. She was devastated. She said, this means I have to start all over again, right? She took this dot instantly into a story about my cancer is back, I'm gonna need more treatment, my doctor isn't being proactive. Uh, I looked at this and realized she hadn't really had a CT scan like this before that went through this part of her chest. I wasn't sure if this is really cancer or not. So in fact, the data weren't a story, right? That's illustration number one. Okay, next. I have another patient named George who has metastatic pancreas cancer. One of the things we track and that he tracks is his blood test tumor marker, which is this test called CA199. And these are a bunch of his CA199s over a period of weeks. You know, you can tell it's going up. He asked me, um, at what level does it get when I die? Right? His expectation about the data was this marker would rise to a certain level and he would die. Like there was a one-to-one -one correlation with this. He assumed that this data meant uh, that there was some kind of correlation with objective reality, that the data was an objective reality, right? And it turned out that during this entire period of time, his CT scan didn't change at all. So in fact, this data wasn't something about an objective reality. Third illustration. Uh, this is one from one of Gina's studies. Um, and if one of you are a designer out there, could you please help us with this EMR and this way of looking at blood pressures? The doctor said, uh, 
you know what, I know what it means and I know what to do when I have two blood pressures in, taken in clinic over a six month period, right? I know that means I need to jump into action, I need to treat this person, right? Uh, he, the doctor went on to say, I don't know what to do when I have two elevated readings out of 2,000, right? Because it turns out we don't know what to do with that. So uh, he was assuming that data meant action. Both the doctor and the tracker were assuming that data meant action. And the reality is, actually, you can take data, you can collect it in a certain way, you can interpret it in a certain kind of context, and it might become actionable, but data by themselves are not action, right? So the point I'm making is data is not a story, data is not objective reality, whoops, data is not action. Um, but you can use data to build a story, you can use data to get closer to the reality, and you can use data to uh, create action. But now that I've made data really complicated, you know, maybe a little too complicated, like what, what could I say now? You know, maybe the real question is, and, and in a way this is a question the whole conference has been asking, what do e-patients need from physicians, right? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about empathy, about openness, about expertise, um, and what, is, uh, what, what about that? I mean, maybe the real issue from this talk is, you know, what new roles could physicians take in this world where patients are producing their own data, right? So I have three recommendations for providers. One is remember that you are dealing with multiple data valences, right? If you uh, saw the you know, beautiful visualization by Doug Cantor, and, and I'm using this uh, as a gift from him. I mean, this really interesting graph of his insulin weekly total and his running mileage weekly total, that is totally fascinating, right? There is no precedent for this in the world of medicine. If I were his physician, though, I would not be going, I would not be saying to him first thing, this is what I make of that data. I would be saying, what do you want to do with that data? This data has many possible uses, and our discussion would have to define what that data could be used for and how I could contribute to it. I mean, the question for me as a doctor would be, how can I contribute to the data valence that's happening here, right? Second, your new role is about sorting out the valences, right? Uh, and I have a failure story of my own to tell here. I had a patient who got uh, treated for this really horrible GI cancer, had this radical surgery, came back, uh, came to see me for the first time and had a CT scan that showed this. This was part of the report. Thickening suggestive of local recurrence, right? So that was the report. I gave her the report because actually most of my patients want to see their reports, but then I went to look at the image with the radiologist and look at it with the surgeon and what we decided was that we should recommend that she have a laparoscopy as the least invasive way of figuring out if this was really a real thing, right? While I was doing that, she was getting massive amounts of email from her entire online support group that said, you need to get this resected immediately, right? So she was kind of in a panic. I did not know enough to negotiate these different valences, right? The valence for me was, it's indeterminate and the radiologist is trying to tell me with these words that you need to pay attention to this, right? It's an alert for me. She was looking at this data valence, not ever having seen the images, going, oh my God, disaster is happening and you know, they're not doing anything. Um, so she found another surgeon. The surgeon went into her abdomen. He found no cancer, and she left the hospital with a chronic pain syndrome that has never resolved. She still has it to this day. So, uh, and I, I think the, the issue there is, I mean, who knows what would have happened if I had been more skillful, but I, I wasn't skillful at negotiating this issue of what are the different data valences here, because clearly this data meant something very different to me than it meant to her. Number three. Multiple data valences reflect different and parallel illness stories. There is not one story. We are always dealing with a multiplicity of stories that overlay on top of each other. And um, when I go and paint, I'm not sick. I don't feel sick. I'm creating something. And my mind is on my creation, not on being a sick person. 
So we were married uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, Vanessa was an artist. I was a scientist. So we have totally different ways of looking at, at the world and at, at the scientist. As I know, there's information on the internet. And I went to the uh, probably the National Cancer Institute site, and I saw that the, at, at that time the survival rate for uh, stage four colorectal cancer was was not good. It was like five-year survival rate of five percent. I admired the way dogs live their lives and I would do my best to live my life in the same kind of a way. They don't look up things on the internet and scare themselves. And I thought, wow, that's a really practical way to approach the whole thing. Right. <laughs> so this is, this is how different data valences create different stories and our patients and their families are living all these stories simultaneously. So we as as clinicians, we need to learn to negotiate this. And the issue has become more acute now, right? Um, because in conclusion, um, what I'm going to say is technology is now enabling this unprecedented flow of data. That this is data that patients produce, they collect, they curate, they analyze. You know, we as physicians now, I mean, I, I feel like I'm practicing medicine in a different world with these people and that my job has completely changed. You know, the exact skills that I would use, I, I think, are beyond the scope of this talk. But what I'd like to point out is that whatever the repertoire turns out to be that we need, it is going to have to be something that includes a really complex understanding of the ways people construct meaning from data. Thank you.